All right, let's take our course books to begin our time of worship. Turn toward the back, we'll sing this to the tune of the old rugged cross. We sing it, Christ of the Cross, is the one we worship. And wherever it says, till his trophies at last he lays down, he'll never lay them down, but he brings them home, each one, not one for whom he died will perish. So we'll just make that little chain. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. It was on that old cross Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me. So I cherish the Christ of the cross till his trophies at last he brings home. I will cling to the Christ of the cross and I'll praise him in glory that day. The Christ of the cross, so despised by the world, has a wondrous attraction for me. For the dear Lamb of God left his glory above to bear sin on dark Calvary. So I'll cherish the Christ of the cross till his trophies at last he brings home. I will cling to the Christ of the cross and I'll praise him in glory that day. On the old rugged cross stained with blood so divine a wondrous beauty I see. It was on that old cross Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me. So I'll cherish the Christ of the cross till his trophies at last he brings home. I will cling to the Christ of the cross, and I'll praise him in glory that day. To the Christ of the cross, I will ever be true, his shame and reproach gladly bear. Then he'll call me someday, for by his grace I am saved, and his glory forever I'll share. So I'll cherish the Christ of the cross, till his trophies at last he brings home. I will cling to the Christ of the cross, and I'll praise him in glory that day. Amen. All right, let's take our Bibles and turn together to Proverbs chapter 25. My text today is taken from verse 1 down to verse 7. And I want to speak with you about the unsearchable riches of Christ. Now, a lot of people will say, well, where do you see Christ in the text? I don't see his name. Well, just because his name is not there doesn't mean that he's not there. And this is part of the blindness of our generation. And 
previous generations is that they read the Bible with natural eyes. And so what's clearly in the scriptures to the glory and honor of Christ, no matter where you look, yet if his name is not specifically mentioned, people say, well, he's not there. And I would add that even when his name is there, they don't see who he is. It's just a man who came, lived, died, rose again, ascended on high. You can believe all of those facts about Christ and still not believe any more than the devil because even the devils believe and tremble. They know who he is. But here in our text, Christ is here because when it says in verse 2, it is the glory of God. Wherever you see the glory of God mentioned in Scripture, I don't care if it's back there in the tabernacle, the temple, he cause his glory to be manifest. Wherever you see the glory of God, put Christ. Because he is that one whose name is above all names. And God the Father has purposed to glorify his Son in all things, whether in creation or providence, the unfolding of all things, in time and history, in salvation, and yes, even in condemnation is what we're going to see here in this passage. But let's read it. Have a word of prayer, and I pray the Lord will open our eyes. These are also Proverbs of Solomon, which the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah, copied out. It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search out a matter. The heaven for height and the earth for depth and the heart of kings is unsearchable. Take away the dross from the silver and there shall come forth a vessel for the finer. Take away the wicked from before the king and his throne shall be established in righteousness. Put not forth thyself in the presence of the king and stand not in the place of great men. For better it is that it be said unto thee, come up hither than that thou shouldst be put lower in the presence of the prince whom thine eyes have seen. Let's have a word of prayer. Gracious Father, I ask that you would direct our minds and hearts even now as we take up your word. Pray that it would not just be as a matter of habit as we do to take the word and read it, but that you would indeed grant us hearing ears and seeing eyes and that through your word, you would be pleased once again to reveal Christ in our hearts. We know that he's here. We know that your word reveals him, but we need your spirit to teach us. So we thank you for your presence, where two or three are gathered in your name. There you are. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your spirit. And Lord, I pray that you'd be our teacher during this time. And give you the praise and honor in Christ's precious name. Amen. Now we know from what Christ himself declared, the Spirit does not speak of himself, but he takes those things that pertain unto Christ and reveals them unto us. And though we know that this word that we're reading here is the inspired word of God, a lot of times people speak of the men being inspired. As you would hear people say, oh boy, he was really inspired when he spoke that or wrote that. But it's not the men that were inspired, it's the word that was inspired. The men were but writers. They were the means that God used to record and put down in writing those things that God purposed should be revealed concerning his son. And I dare say that even what they wrote, many of these did not fully comprehend or understand what they were writing as to how it would be ultimately fulfilled in Christ. Yet the spirit of Christ being in them, they knew that it pertained to one greater than they. And so we can speak of the writers of scripture, but in reality, there's only one author. And that author is the spirit of God himself, yea, even the spirit of Christ. And 
The Spirit's work is to take the things of Christ and reveal them unto us. So when we read here in verse 25, as we've been going through the book of Proverbs, this is actually a third book. So it starts then this section, this is a new section, and identifies these as being the Proverbs of Solomon. And we've studied how Solomon is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. But just that, in himself, he was weak and fallen. And yet his office and his kingship, and what he represented, served as a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. Even our Lord recognized that in his day when they were remarking about Solomon's temple. And Solomon, he said, there's a greater than Solomon here. But those of his generation were just as blind. And so when it says these are also Proverbs of Solomon, Solomon wrote over 3,000 Proverbs during his lifetime. They're not all recorded here. And this is the thing about Scripture is that it's not an exhaustive declaration of everything that was said and done concerning Christ. In fact, John wrote about that, that if, if the world, all the books in the world could not contain all of the sayings and doings of our Lord Jesus Christ. And yes, it is selective history. In other words, there are parts here we'll never know. But we know this, that what has been written here is sufficient for us to know all that is necessary to know concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we read the Old Testament, the types, the pictures, the prophecies, the promises, all of these things teach us of Christ and his glory. I find it interesting that with all that is revealed, in the word, people still like to go outside the word and speculate. And the answer there is, it's not written. It's not for us to know. In Deuteronomy chapter 29 and verse 29, if you want to turn there, and this is part of the hidden wisdom of God. This is where we see that it is the glory of God to conceal a thing. And that's his right to do so. Back here in Deuteronomy chapter 29 and verse 29. It says here, the secret things belong unto the Lord our God. Now, when it says secret things, that means those things that God in his eternal purpose and will, purpose should be. And when you get into the book of Revelation, Chapter 5, the, the author there, the writer, speaks of a, a scroll written on the outside and on the inside where there wasn't any room to add anything. That little book is a picture of God's decrees and what his purpose should be. And all of that comes out of his secret counsel. Secret means that it remains secret until such time as he's pleased to reveal it. And so even with everything we have here in Scripture, even here it is not sufficient to define all that is in God's mind. People want to know why. I was at a dinner party the other night, and there was a pretty knowledgeable man that was there at the table. And his question was, if he could have one question answered, what would it be? And he spoke very deliberately. I was sitting at an angle and watching him. And, and he, he was like, of all the years or times that Christ could have been born, and then he takes his finger and puts it down, why then? Why at that time? And not before, not after. And, you know, I'll, I'll let different ones talk for a while. And, then someone said, well, maybe Ken has the answer. And I said, it was foreordained. Very plainly, foretold in the scriptures that it would be at that time. But that wasn't sufficient. He still wanted, he came back to his question again, but why then? 
and I was sitting next to his wife, actually, and when I said the word foreordained, she looked over at me and she goes, foreordained? Hmm. It's not a word that people are accustomed to hearing. In fact, most people think that things unfold at random, but none of it is random. All of that comes from right here. The secret things belong unto the Lord our God. He doesn't have to justify, defend, explain, or answer any one of us. It is because God has so purposed and is according to his secret will. When it says secret things, it's talking about those things that are from God's mind. And this is part of the unsearchable riches that we're looking at because all of that is in Christ. When God created the world from the his secret purpose and how he made it, people like, no, couldn't God have stopped the fall? No, he couldn't have because in his purpose, even before Adam fell, there was Christ there as the Savior in whose hand he had already given a number of sinners that no man can number for whom Christ would come into this world and pay their sin debt. So it was impossible already in the secret things that belong unto God, it was impossible that this be a perfect world. God purposed the fall that his son be exalted. And you can go right down each of those four areas wherein God proves himself to be God in creation is to the glory of Christ. Providence. See, we've been accustomed to thinking that everything kind of turns around us. So if I have a bad day, what do people think? Oh, well, I didn't have my devotions this morning. I should have prayed more. Uh, could have, would have, should have. But that's not, it doesn't revolve around us. If the Lord be our teacher, we'll understand that no matter what takes place, it's to the glory and honor of Christ, one way or another. And in the matters of salvation, see, this is the greatest evidence of depravity of the heart, is that men always want to insert themselves into the purpose and will of God and make it somehow dependent upon them. It's not, it's all of Christ. And in condemnation, the same thing. He saves whom he will and he condemns whom he will. And if you try to figure out why, well, why is this one saved and this one condemned, it all comes back to the secret things that belong to the Lord our God. In fact, when Christ prayed to the Father, he thanked the Father that the Father had hidden these things from the wise and the prudent of the world, but had revealed them unto babes. And then that's a point of contention with most people. They're like, they got their back up already. Oh no, you mean God determines these things? No, no. See, that proves depravity as well. That's that rebellion of the heart. But what's the answer when people don't like the answer? Christ said, for even so, it seemed good in thy sight. That's the answer. No matter how many times that man came back to the question, why then? Why exactly at that time? God purposed it. Scriptures say in the fullness of the time. Don't forget the the there. It's in the scripture. In the fullness of the time, God sent forth his son, made him a woman, made him the law, to redeem those that were under the law. So those are the secret things. Those are the unsearchable riches of Christ. Where Christ himself said, the father judges no man, but has given all judgment into his hand. People today think that somehow... They can get to God through various means. They kind of give lip service to the son, but in reality, they're asking people to pray for them. There's some that when I die, make sure you're burning enough candles. Call on this saint or that saint. All of that is idolatry. And it shows the blindness of the heart because Christ himself said when he was here on this earth that no man comes unto the father, but by me. It's all about Christ. And the secret things that belong unto the Lord our God are all about Christ, all about honoring and glorifying him to the point that in the end, everybody will be there that God purposed to be there. It won't be as some of these preachers you hear saying, well, make sure that you're in heaven because you don't want to have your name placed there but an empty seat. It's not going to be that way. 
Everyone's going to be there that God purposed to be there and that Christ died to save and has saved. And the Spirit will draw in his time. Those are the secret things of God. But it says those things which are revealed belong unto us. There are a lot of things about what I've just described that aren't revealed. And we're not to become curious about those things that are not revealed. Many times the question's asked, and I've had some say, oh, I don't think it's in the Bible, but what they're asking you to do is speculate. Well, if it's not in the Bible, then let's, let's not talk about it. If we can't look back and see what God has to say about whatever matter it is, then let's not talk about it. And here is those things which are revealed belong unto us and our children forever. That means that even from generation to generation, the way that God has purpose, that his word be communicated, it be through this revealed word right here, this inspired word, the preached word, but through the word. And that we may do all the words of this law. Well, what is it to do all the words of this law? It's to see yourself as utterly condemned before holy God. All this law can do is condemn. And to look to Christ alone as he that came to fulfill it. That's what's vital. And so as we come back here to our text, when it mentions these men here, these are also Proverbs of Solomon, which the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah, copied out. Stop and think about what we're holding in our hand here. These words were written over 4,000 years ago. In fact, the entire scripture was written over a period of 1,500 years by 40 different writers. And the care that the Lord caused these men to take and copy these scriptures word for word. That's why I encourage you, if you have a strong concordance, go back and look at what it was in the original. And then look at the word that, that we have in English. The carefulness, even though some of these and most of these did not even know Christ. Certainly the scribes and Pharisees didn't. They were anti-Christ, and yet the Lord gave them a care to make copies of the scriptures where they went back and counted what they called jot and tittle. They counted every little mark that could make a difference in the meaning of a word and made sure that it was all there. That wasn't from them. That was the Lord doing this. And even that, I say, is part of the unsearchable riches of Christ to where he and his sovereignty so ordains and directs that in the end, men will serve his purpose, whether they know him or not. And it will be to his honor and glory. And so I'm thankful that these here that are mentioned, the Lord purposed should record to his honor. I know they honored themselves. They they were kind of in competition with each other. Who could do the best job? And they, It's like after an assignment, you hand the, the scripture over to somebody else to check it. And if an error was found, it would be corrected. Such was the painstaking way in which we have today these, these scriptures recorded. And yet the Lord purposed it for his honor and glory. So that brings us to verse 2, that it is the glory of God to conceal a thing. And it's the honor of kings to search out a matter. Notice, to conceal a thing. God doesn't have to reveal his son to anybody. That's the point of contention with many today. Just the thought that God would reveal his son to some and hide him from others. They find fault with God on that. No, if he's going to do it, he ought to be fair. And I think he ought to reveal it to everybody. He doesn't. Notice, it is the glory of God to conceal a thing. And when it says the honor of kings to search out a matter, back in the day, the kings were the ones that people looked to for answers. They were educated. Many of the people weren't educated. So they looked to these kings to search out a matter. Remember when the Lord brought the wise men from the east? And... Uh, they said that they were looking for 
they follow the star and looking for the child that should be born. And Herod commanded his counselors and everybody to search in the scriptures to find out what these things were. And yet it was hidden from him, but it was revealed unto others that the Lord brought from afar. That's his will to do so. This Bible has been completed now for nearly 2,000 years. It used to be you could find a copy in most hotel rooms. Now, a lot of the hotel rooms have taken them out because a lot of the owners are, are either Muslim or Indian or whatever. And so they're going to put their Quran or whatever they believe in in those rooms. But nonetheless, this still, this book we hold in our hand is still the number one seller in the world. And yet, how often it's read, and today, even at this hour, being priests, most congregations, even if they're the most liberal, they're going to have a scripture somewhere that they put in there to, to kind of put a stamp on the fact that it's Christian. That's what they call it. But how blind and how ignorant people are, even reading these words as we read it right now, and yet don't see Christ. You say, well, who makes the difference? God does. It's the glory of God to conceal a thing. Secret things, like we saw, belong unto him. And there are many things that I will tell you we dare not even try to explain. How many times have you had somebody say to you, can you explain to me the Trinity? Well, if you start using the illustration of a, a stool that has uh, supposed to have, or a chair supposed to have four legs and and uh, only has uh, has three, or you one supposed to have three, it's only got two, and how it wobbles, and you need it all. They try to use the illustration of a stool to explain how the three are one. That's just man's reasoning. How about just declaring what the scriptures teach? I've had people argue with me and say, well, I don't ever see, I don't see the word Trinity in the Bible. Well, there are other ways that, the Lord describes who he is. And so these things are hidden to them. He's called the Godhead. In Christ, the fullness of the Godhead dwells. And when you read, you read about the Father, you read about the Son, you read about the Spirit, the three are one. So it doesn't necessarily require that the word Trinity appear, just as I said earlier. It doesn't require that the name Christ appear in every verse for you to say, okay, now it's about Christ. No. Even those things are hidden. Those are the secret things that are hidden from God. Who God is, the relationship between the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, and how all three, it's the Son, they're one, but the Son is, is God, is the Father's purpose to receive the glory. These are secret things. We believe them because they're revealed. And preaching isn't trying to explain everything. It's preaching is declaring what God has said. That's when we go down here verse by verse. Just in that word glory, you could spend an eternity defining glory. The word means heavy. It means a weight. And that's what the glory of God is. It is a weight. I truly believe that if God were to reveal himself as he is in all of his glory, it would kill us. It would crush us. We cannot look upon God and live. That's why there's the meteor. That's why he sent his son. The son is the visible image of the invisible God. And so we dare not try to come up with explanations for men that are going to, well, if, if you can explain, it's like one man told me, if you can explain election to me, then I'll believe. Well, you don't explain election. You declare it. And it's very simple. Out of all of fallen humanity, even before the world was created, God named out, called out, determined who it is that he would save. And the rest, because they come up with other little things, they say, okay, so he just permits the others to be condemned. No, he ordains. He ordains salvation and he ordains condemnation. Those are the secret things that, that are concealed. And unless God opens our eyes, then 
will ever be blind to it. And so even here we see in this very simple statement, his glory is even above kings. Think of the most educated of men. It's the honor of kings to search out a matter. The problem today in men's depravity is that they're searching out many of other matters, politically and socially, but they're not searching out these matters, which in little time will matter. You stop and think about it. 100 years from now, none of us are going to be around. And we don't know, again, when God has purpose to take us from this world, but this is not theory, what we're about right now. This is about who God is and how he's been pleased to reveal himself in this word and the fact that every creature will stand before him, either saved and justified already in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ or condemned. There's not going to be a long, drawn-out trial where everybody's going to have an opportunity to defend themselves. No. When you read in Matthew 25, it simply says to those for whom God has prepared the kingdom, the sheep, he says, enter into the kingdom that the Father has prepared for you. And for the rest, the goats on his left, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. And they're cast into utter darkness. But even those things are the glory of God concealed as to who it is that God saves or condemns, how it is he saves. All of that's in his determining. And does not have to give an account to men. A lot of people want to hold God to account as if he owes man an answer. He doesn't. Even that is part of his honor and his glory, such as his person. So down in verse 3 of my text, all in line with the unsearchable riches of Christ. Here it speaks of the heaven for height. The earth for depth, the heart of kings, is unsearchable. You can't even identify or study physical things. You think about different disciplines that are taught in school. You know, you've got your geologists, you've got your medical doctors, and then you've got your dentists, you've got your engineers, you've got your architects. Everybody's studying a particular discipline. Do you know of any degree that is given out in our higher institutes of learning there, whereby they give you a master's for having mastered everything. It doesn't matter what the discipline, you got it. I don't know anybody like that. But even the things that are created, it's beyond man's searching. How much more so then, and that's really the point of verse three, the heaven for height. We're still trying to figure out what's out there, space. But that's one discipline. And then the earth for depth. I love to read about these things because people are dedicating their time and money and energy trying to figure out just the oceans. Say nothing about lands or nothing about volcanoes or other things, but the, but the earth for depth. And then the heart of the kings. Who can even, they're trying to do studies on the way the brain thinks and uh, basing it on intellect and IQ and all these things and trying to lay out a pattern. You can't. Those things are unsearchable. A person is who he is. Even they, they try to figure out which make the best leaders and it's a certain personality type and, and those are the ones. Well, who can even know how the best of men by our standards can think and reason? It says here, even that is unsearchable. The king doesn't even know his own heart. But it's the Lord that directs it all. The, the scriptures say that he has the heart of the king in his hand and turns it whithersoever he will. Why do certain ones make decisions this way that lead to war? Why do others make decisions that lead to peace? And people think, well, it's the counselors surrounding the ruler that have to help him determine all these things. But how a man thinks and how a man decides, it's not up to the man. There's not anything that is decided or determined by man but what God has already determined it. And there again, people don't like that. See, ultimately, man thinks that he has the power and authority to decide as he will. He doesn't. It's this great God here that we serve and worship to whom the secret things belong. And I'll tell you this, the only man 
that God has ever purposed, honor, and glorify is his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. All others serve his purpose. He's, that's why he's called the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You know, I'm happy to have it that way. I can't even bring order to my own life. We all determine certain things and we get up and the Lord blasts the boards, just takes it out of the way. So then you're, okay, how are the Lord's leading and directing? We may not know one second from now how he's directing, but how you can look back on your life, no matter how that road is turned and twisted. But the scriptures say, even our wanderings, are they not written in his book as to whether you turn right or left? Again, people don't like that. I had somebody say to me, well, all you're doing is making robots out of men. And I said, well, no, even that's too sophisticated. <laughs> the scriptures say we're nothing but clay. What is clay? But what the potter determines to make of it. Don't sophisticate it by calling people robots. Now, we're nothing but clay that unless God is pleased to make something to his honor and glory, that's all be dead clay, dry. No matter how you water it, it's still clay. So that's the Lord's to determine. And so you read on, take away the dross from the silver and there shall come forth a vessel for the fire. Even in this, you talk about the dross, that's when you take and put it in the furnace. It's to separate out what is useless, which is what dross is. It's worthless and useless, but it, it's, and I'm not even going to pretend to explain how dross gets on the silver and, and clay. It has something to do with the acid reactions and whatnot. But no matter what, with all of that dross, there is that silver that God himself, his purpose, should be for good. And it's the Lord that purposes the dross. It's the Lord that purposes what is silver. And he's going to bring everything through his refining fire. So men can appear, for example, to be one thing, and yet when put to the fire, you find out that it's nothing but dross. Now, anything that's true silver is of Christ. Anything that's true gold is going to be of Christ. And it's going to be the Lord that tries everything that's false. There are a lot of false preachers that attach themselves to the silver. In other words, they take the things of Christ that are written here and they pervert it even more. All that's dross. And in time, the Lord is going to prove what is true and what is false. He does that according to his sovereign purpose as well. That's why Job said that when the Lord would try him, his prayer was that he would come forth as gold. In other words, that his profession not be simply that, a profession, but it truly be a work of Christ. It truly be, he'd be one that stands before God accepted in the below. He spoke of that, Job. He said, I know that my Redeemer liveth, and in that day shall stand on this earth. He's not talking about a future. He's talking about when Christ would come to this world. And that when Christ would do the work, he would take away all that was dross concerning Job, all that was sin, all that Christ would bear. And when he came forth, he would be pure as gold. Not anything in him, but in Christ. So even these are part of the unsearchable riches of Christ. How does God does that work? To some, that fire is for condemnation. To others, it's for the, the glorification of Christ, that we might know it's nothing in us but holy in him. So he says in verse 5, take away the wicked from before the king. How does the Lord do that? Well, any that for whom he didn't pay the debt, they shall most certainly, the debt they shall most certainly be cast away. No questions asked. But that's how his throne, it says, his throne shall be established in righteousness. It's the righteousness of God that the, the Lord Jesus Christ came and earned and established that God has imputed to those that he has purposed to save. All others will be taken away. That line clearly drawn there, take away the wicked from before the king. You're not going to come before him with your works or your will or any good that you think you have. All that will be taken away from the king. His throne shall be established in righteousness. You say, well, I don't see Christ. There he is. 
How is his throne established in righteousness? It's established in his son. That when he came, he worked out all that the law and justice of God required, that God might be just and declare righteous those for whom he did the work. It's just as simple as that. And yet men continue to believe that somehow what they do is going to give them right standing before God, and they're going to find out just the opposite. They'll be cast out of his presence forever. That's why verse 6 and 7 are important. Put not forth thyself in the presence of the king. When people preach up free will, that's what they're doing. Hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this myself. It's by my choice. No, you won't. No, you don't. Put not forth thyself in the presence of the king and stand not in the place of great men. Don't think, well, look how many other people believe like I do. And, and they're striving and they're working and they're willing. That's the wrong crowd there. Don't put any confidence in those that stand in the place of great men. People like to base what they believe on great men of the past and what they've written and how they believed. I had one say that. You mean to tell me you think you know better than some of these others that have been preachers down through the years? Not that I know better because it's not of me, but I know what is right concerning Christ and what he's revealed in his word. And there I stand, regardless of what other supposed great men have stood. So don't put yourself in there in the presence of the king. The only one that matters is the Lord Jesus Christ. And far better it is that it be said unto thee, come up hither. That's the only way any of us can be brought before God is to be called out by his spirit in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then that thou shouldst be put lower in the presence of the prince whom thine eyes have seen. Put lower means to be utterly cast out from his presence. So such are the unsearchable riches of Christ. And I think you'd agree with me, we put scratch the surface, but that's why they're unsearchable. The Lord gives his spirit to go and read again these verses that we've contemplated. May the Lord be our teacher. All right, we'll meet back here just in a few minutes.